Our climate is changing. The world is warming. Sea levels are rising faster than ever. And extreme weather is becoming more frequent and more intense. The science is clear. Human actions are to blame. Climate change is the defining crisis of our time. We are in a climate emergency. I spent most of my career trying to measure the climate impacts of our actions in the hopes that governments can identify the best policies or businesses can find the right strategies to help us slow the damage. Since the Industrial Revolution, the world learned to produce everything faster and cheaper. As societies got richer, we produced more and consumed more energy, more materials, and more food. What we need is a new industrial revolution, a new playbook that decouples growth from emissions. That revolution is gaining momentum. Food, it sustains us and so much more, but it could soon run out. Affluence is driving up consumption. So is growth in populations. At the rate we're eating, the world needs to grow as much as 70% more food in just 30 years. An unthinkable target if how we eat and grow our food remains unchanged. This is agriculture as we know it today, a land, water, and energy intensive industry. Also well known is its greenhouse gas emissions. Forests are nature's carbon sinks, and when that's cleared for farming, more carbon is released to the atmosphere. Modern agriculture also involves machinery, which burn fuel, and there's fertilizers, which also have a carbon footprint. And since farms are located far away from cities, the food miles also drive up carbon emissions. Even before it reaches our plates, food would have already released 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions globally. Vertical farms grow fruits and vegetables much more efficiently. This is a Bowery farm. It's 100 times more productive per square foot than a traditional farm. It's also packed with technology that controls every aspect of the farm's environment. Our system can say, based on what we see and what we know, but also what we expect, what tweaks and changes to the environment around this specific crop do we want to make? And then those changes get pushed out and automatically adjusted. So you have this powerful recursive learning loop that's iterating, testing, watching, iterating, testing, watching at a very large scale, which is helping to drive not only increases in yields, but really exciting, fun, vibrant taste and flavors in the crops that we grow themselves. Because conditions are so carefully controlled, Bowery grows a diverse variety of crops. That includes many that are just too fragile for traditional farms and long distribution journeys. The farm is just outside the city, so distribution is cheaper and faster and produce fresher when it reaches the stores. We think about sustainability as being multi-dimensional. So it's of course the component of resources, but it's also economic sustainability and commercial sustainability. And so we think a lot about how do we make sure that we can democratize access to high quality fresh produce. Everybody should be able to try great flavorful produce all the time. While Bowery makes farms more efficient, Unfold selects and develops seeds that are more productive for vertical farming. There's been a lot of investment in the sector, but it's really been focused on the infrastructure of the farm really amazing state-of-the-art facilities to grow the crops. What was missing was the genetics or the seed that really is optimized to be grown under those conditions. Unfold works on seed genetics and digital solutions to offer new seed varieties for fruits and vegetables. They want to help people worldwide get fresh, local, and great tasting produce. So you want to have seed that actually can respond to all that environmental control that really is optimized for production under artificial light with a, you know, the systems that control all the other environmental pieces. What are the ways you can optimize the performance of that seed so that they can overcome those challenges and provide not just a product that works for them, 
but a product that really delivers at the consumer level the kind of quality that the consumer is looking for. Another type of farming is headed for a reboot. Livestock makes up half of global methane emissions. Methane is a greenhouse gas and it's 26 times more potent than CO2. But new technologies in our midst are making us rethink what we know of meat. The Impossible Burger. It's claimed to taste exactly like meat, but it's made from plants. It even bleeds like a medium rare burger. The protein packing burger is made from soy and potatoes, and the fats come from coconut and sunflower oils. There's also a mix of flavor ingredients along with heme, which provides the look, feel, and taste of meat. Heme's not only responsible for the flavor of meat, it's also a basic building block of life on Earth. And it's, it's present in every cell, whether it's an animal or a plant. It just happens to be more abundant in animal cells. And so what our scientists discover is you could also get that from plants. We started by extracting heme from the root nodules of soybeans. And that's why our heme is called soy lake hemoglobin. So we then adapted to do a fermentation process, which is the same process used for Belgian beer or for making cheeses. Um, and so we use that process, it's much more scalable, and essentially you're growing that same heme, the same heme that's found in the roots of soy, uh, but you're growing it in yeast. Um, and, and then that makes it much more efficient, much more scalable, and so we're able to provide that ingredient into our product at a low cost. Impossible is sold as meatless alternatives in restaurants and supermarkets in the U.S., Hong Kong, and Singapore. In the U.S., the plant-based meat market, including Impossible and others, is worth 1.4 billion U.S. dollars, making up 2.7% of all U.S. retail packaged meat sales. Impossible says 9 out of 10 of its customers are traditional meat eaters. Meat made from Impossible versus meat made from a cow uses 87% less water, 96% less land, 89% less carbon emissions, and contributes 92% less water pollution. If you were to purchase one pack of our retail product in store, that would be equivalent to saving 250 bottles of water. And those are the big bottles, the bottles that are 500 milliliters, um, just with that one pack of Impossible Burger. Other meats are heading in a similar direction, like chicken, by far the most consumed meat worldwide. Tyndall is a plant-based chicken alternative with just as impressive carbon savings. If you look at a Tyndall and compare it to animal chicken, it's about 88% less greenhouse gas emissions, 82% less water consumption, and 74% less land. Tyndall's plant-based chicken is made like this. There are nine ingredients that go into it water, soy, wheat gluten, wheat starch, sunflower oil, natural flavoring, coconut oil, methyl cellulose, and oat fiber. The sunflower oil and natural flavoring are what makes Lippy, a proprietary emulsion. Lippy gives Tyndall the aroma, taste, and cookability of chicken. Put in a simple way, it's chicken fat made entirely out of plants. It's an emulsion uh, made with natural ingredients, entirely from plants that recreates all the experience you would expect from chicken fat. All of it will come inside the fibers before the product is created. When you're cooking, you will see it manifesting itself through the browning, the smell, the taste, and when you eat it, you can definitely resemble that, that delicious chicken taste that we all love. Tyndall, which is based in Singapore, was developed in collaboration with local chefs. Singapore was where Tyndall launched its global debut and now has over 100 restaurant partners across the world. When Singapore did set itself to become a, let's call it a Silicon Valley of food tech, the amount of transformation that has been happening has been quite substantial. Um, if you compare back to 2018, 17 to today, it's a completely different environment in terms of venture capital, in terms of startups, in terms of multinational companies with the R&D centers here and universities developing as well. Um, they are programs around sustainable food. Among more recent entrants joining the fold is one startup that's making meat from microalgae. Where there is water, there is microalgae. You can find it anywhere on this planet, in the ocean, in the freshwater. Sometimes you can even find it 
in the fossil records. The microalgae is placed in a fermentation tank and fed food waste like spent grain, okara, and molasses. The microalgae grows and it's harvested within three days and turned into a flower that's rich in proteins. Different strains of microalgae, also the way it's grown or fed, could determine different food flavors resembling different foods. The company plans to work with plant-based protein producers to replace soy and other flours. Flour from microalgae grows faster and uses fewer resources. It will also be a lot more sustainable when you trying to produce it. And not only that, don't forget, microalgae has all the essential amino acids needed by the human being. It even has all the vitamin B group. So nutrition-wise, it will possibly be even better than all the protein flour that we're using so widely today. Plant-based meat alternatives are one thing, but how about making meat without animals? Upside Foods, based in California, grows real meat from stem cells in a process that is similar to fermentation. In 2017, Upside Foods demonstrated the world's first cultivated chicken. We take high quality animal cells from cows and pigs and chickens, and we find the cells that can continue to grow and double and double and double just as they would inside an animal. At the end of it, when they touch each other, they start forming tissues just like they would in an animal. And then once they start forming tissues, they start developing thicker and thicker layers of muscle and fat and connective tissues. And when we start to cook our favorite foods, you start experiencing food as it should be with the deliciousness and the desirability of meat, but not the enormous downsides that come with raising billions of animals to feed humans who love eating meat. Traditional meat and dairy industries using livestock farming account for 14.5% of total man-made emissions. That's 7.1 gigatons of greenhouse gases annually. At scale, Upside expects its cultivated meat production to emit significantly fewer greenhouse gases. Independent researchers project cuts in emissions by as much as 90%. When we talk about first principles, Cultivated meat takes animal cells and grows them directly into meat, whereas an animal has to do a lot more. In addition to growing meat on it, it has to run around, heal broken bones, have babies. So it uses a lot of calories for things that are not going into making meat. So at a very simple level with cultivated meat, all the calories we feed our animal cells are being used to make meat. So therefore, by a very vast margin, cultivated meat is going to be much more efficient in the world to produce meat with less resources. Another Singaporean startup disrupts livestock agriculture in a different way. Turtle Tree makes milk in a lab. The process also involves stem cells, in this case from freshly expressed milk. Stem cells are grown in a bioreactor. Then, lactation is induced in Turtle Tree's patented lactation media, a liquid that contains various components naturally present in mammals. The process yields milk components, and these could be used to produce various dairy products. If you look at cellular agriculture technology, it's a lot more efficient. Reduces greenhouse emission gas by as much as 78 to 96%. Uh, reduces water usage from 82 to 96%, and reduces uh, land usage by 99%. So it's a far more efficient way and humane way to produce milk. Turtle Tree says all milk from mammals could be produced using their process. Even infant milk powder, currently made with cow's milk. It's an industry worth 3.5 billion US dollars annually and growing rapidly. Turtle Tree's technology could make the industry much more sustainable and give people of all ages the benefits of human milk. Another new development is the epitome of future food. Imagine if food could be made from just air. Food out of thin air sounds like science fiction, but actually at Solar Foods, we've been producing food out of thin air for more than two years. What we are going to do next is build our first commercial facility that we call the demo. It's supposed to be operating in the beginning of 2023. And after that, we scale it to an industrial scale. 
the company makes what they call solene, a protein that's produced with materials that are abundant in nature and a process that could even be carbon negative. That's because land now used for agriculture could be returned, so performing their original role as carbon sinks. It starts with a microorganism cultivated in a fermenter. No sugars or other agricultural agents are used to aid fermentation. Water from air is split by renewable electricity into hydrogen and oxygen. The cells are fed CO2, hydrogen, and mineral nutrients. Enough CO2 for the process could be captured from the air in an occupied room. The fermentation process results in a protein powder, which could replace agricultural products like soy and peas used in making plant-based proteins. We can go literally to produce this food in the middle of desert, and it doesn't end there. We can go in urban settings because every one of us breathes about one kilogram of carbon dioxide out every day. And we can capture, even from the ventilation of buildings, carbon dioxide that we breathe out, capture that and put it back into food in urban settings. Therefore, we can bring food production very close uh, to, to very urban uh, settings and uh, within megacities of future. An agricultural revolution is underway, turning what was once science fiction into reality. Bold new technologies are reducing the environmental impact of food production. It's now up to consumers everywhere to make the switch to more sustainably grown foods, an opportunity for everyone to be a climate trailblazer.